Welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Välkomna till Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin. Välkomna tillbaka alla ni som var här igår. Idag har Vetenskapsakademin eh, sammanträtt för att fatta beslut om årets Nobelpris i kemi. Jag heter Göran K. Hansson och är akademins ständige sekreterare. Och med mig idag har jag ordföranden i Nobelkommittén för kemi, professor Sara Snogerup Linse. Och professor Claes Gustafsson som är ledamot av Nobelkommittén och en av experterna inom prisområdet. I'm Joran Hansen, Secretary General of the Academy, and with me is the Chairman of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry, Professor Sara Snogerup Linse, and also Professor Klaus Gustafsson, member of the Nobel Committee. I will start by announcing the prize and read the citation. Uh, we will hear about the discoveries and the laureates from our experts, and we hope to have one of the laureates with us by phone. And of course, you, ladies and gentlemen of the media, are welcome to ask questions, either in English or in Swedish. Årets pris handlar om cellens verktygslåda för att reparera DNA. This year's prize is about the cell's toolbox for repairing DNA. Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att 2015 års Nobelpris i kemi ska utdelas gemensamt till Thomas Lindahl, Paul Modrich och Aziz Sanjar för mekanistiska studier av DNA-reparation. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the 2015 Nobel Prize in Chemistry jointly to Thomas Lindahl, Paul Modrich and Aziz Sanjar for mechanistic studies of DNA repair. Für mechanistische Untersuchungen betreffend DNA reparatur. Pour leur étude de la réparation de l'ADN. Za isledovanje mechanismo reparatsi DNK. And now, uh, Professor Sora Snugerup Linse, the chair of the Nobel Committee, will give some introductory remarks. Sora, please. Damages occur to your DNA every day. In fact, right here, right now. If all those errors were left uncorrected, your genetic material would have very little resemblance to the original chromosomes in your very first cell. Life as we know it today is totally dependent on DNA repair mechanisms as have been revealed in molecular detail by this year's chemistry laureates. Their findings have enormous consequences. As just one example, they have led to insights what may go wrong in conditions such as cancer. This is a simplified model of DNA. It covers 22 base pairs. This little piece in reality is only eight nanometers long, but every cell of you contains some hundred million times more DNA, which covers a distance of two meters. It contains the recipes to make all the proteins needed to build you and make you function. Almost every cell of you have almost exactly the same DNA. So there must be mechanisms to maintain the information. If I were to pull out the DNA from a human body and place it in one row, it would cover the distance from the Earth to the Sun and back 250 times. Although it's so much, it's remarkably similar. We have a repair mechanism, but we also have a replication machinery that copies the DNA at each cell division, and this has a remarkable fidelity. Still, like every chemical process, it makes mistakes at random, so there will be errors. But the DNA can also be damaged by other insights like radiation, or spontaneous decay, or 
chemicals, poisons, for example, as found in cigarette smoke. All those insults cause a variety of structural changes to the DNA molecule. Therefore, we need multiple repair pathways, as will soon be described by my colleague Klaus Gustafsson. Thank you, Sara. Klaus, you ready to give us some insights into this year's prize? I'm ready. So, uh, this is our DNA, our genetic material. <coughs> and in every single cell in our body, we have genetic material that encodes for the creation of a human being. And this, uh, this information is stored in DNA and is written with a very simple chemical language containing only four letters or four bases, A, T, G, and C. And changes to this information or damages to the DNA can have very serious consequences. So what are those consequences? Well, for instance, DNA damage mutations can cause cancer, and they are also seen as an important, or important contributing factors to normal biological aging. How then do these DNA damages occur? What, how, how do we get them? Well, it turns out that DNA, in spite of being the carrier of genetic information, actually has limited chemical stability. Our first Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Thomas Lindahl, demonstrated that there are a number of spontaneous chem chemical processes in our cells that take place all the time and that breaks down the DNA slowly. For instance, just one of these processes is what you have here. Normally in the DNA you have base pairs between C and G, two different bases. But sometimes, what happens is that the C breaks down and forms a U instead. U is a <coughs> base or a letter that you would normally not found, find in the DNA. And uh, there must be some way to get rid of this. Thomas Lindell calculated that we, this reaction happens about 200 times in every living cell every day. So over time, we would actually lose all our Cs. Thomas speculated there must be a repair system, and he went out to search for it. And he could indeed find one, which a repair system that we now know, now know as base excision repair. What this, this system can do is that it can recognize the U in the DNA, it can flip it out and take it away, and then the number uh, set of other reactions replace the U with the correct C again. This is just one of many types of base repairs that the base excision repair system can take care of. We, now know, we know today that there are more than hundreds different lesions to DNA that can be repaired by the base excision repair system, and it guards the information in our genomes. DNA mutation may also arise during DNA replication, which is the process when the genetic material is copied. And when do you need to copy the DNA? Well, that is when a cell is going to divide, you need to take the genetic information in the first cell, and you need to, to make two copies that can go to the two daughter cells. And in order to do this, you need to replicate or copy DNA. And what happens then is that the double-stranded DNA is split open like this, and each of the two original strands are used as templates to synthesize new companion strands. And during this process, it is extremely important that we recreate exactly the same base pairs that were in the original, original DNA molecule, like this one, a TA. But on very rare occasions, one in a million, there is actually uh, uh, an error introduced. There is a base coming in that shouldn't be there, and we call these incorrect bases mismatches. Our second Nobel Prize laureate, Paul Modrich, he has spent his life trying to figure out how these mismatches, how they are corrected. And uh, he has found a system which we now know as the mismatch repair system. 
And this repair system contains a number of different proteins. And what these proteins can do is that they can recognize a mismatch. You see this red-blue thing here is supposed to be a mismatch. It can recognize a mismatch. And then it can also recognize which of the two strands that are newly synthesized. Because you just want to correct the strand that's newly synthesized. You don't want to change the old strand. And then you cleave the newly synthesized strand and you take away the piece of DNA co containing the mismatch and then the DNA is synth synthesized again and we get the correct strand. This is a very important mechanism that, the mechanism that, that increased the fidelity of DNA replication with a factor of about 1,000. And it's a very important factor in, in preserving genetic information in our genomes. Finally, we can also get damage to our DNA due to external <coughs> sources like UV light, ultraviolet light, present in ordinary sunlight. And one of the, the things that can happen is that if we have two T's, the letter T's here in the DNA next to each other, if we, uh, if we get your ultraviolet light on these T's, sometimes they can actually there can actually be a chemical link performed between them, like this, that destroys the structure of DNA. This has serious consequences both for the structure and function of the DNA, and, uh, and we cannot tolerate that. Our last uh, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Aziz Sanyar, has uh, investigated how one can take away this type of UV-induced damages in DNA. And he has identified the components and characterized the mechanisms of what we, know now, what we now know as nucleotide excision repair. This repair system recognizes uh, uh, these uh, chemically linked T's and then it cleaves the DNA on each side of this UV-induced lesion and cuts away the damaged DNA strand like this. After this, we can synthesize a new piece of DNA which is then uh, chemically correct. This type of nucleotide excision repair is not only important for UV-induced uh, damages, but also take away many other types of damages. For example, those uh, that are created by uh, compounds that, that we get in when we smoke cigarettes. Together, our uh, three Nobel Prize laureates this year have explained basic mechanisms, basic cellular mechanisms at the molecular level that help to guard the integrity of our genomes. And for this, the Royal Academy of Sciences, Swedish uh, Academy of Sciences, is extremely proud to present to them the 2015 year Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Yes. Thank you, Klaus. Great Nobel Prize. Uh, I hope we now may have. Uh, do we have Thomas Lindahl with us uh, on the via phone line from London? Yes, I am here. Oh, good morning again, Thomas. Uh, thank you for your time. Good morning. I missed the first half of the presentation. So I heard what you said, but I didn't hear me on Modric. Yeah, fine. Uh, maybe we should continue in English out of courtesy to our international course, huh? journalists. Yeah. So, who would like to start asking Professor Lindahl a question? Thomas von Heine. Uh, hey, Thomas von Heine, Sveriges Television. Uh, hey. I would like to do it in Swedish also. You will learn to ask questions in later. Ja, jag undrar bara, jag är väldigt nyfiken nu när det handlar om reparation av DNA. Höra lite spekulation. Vart är det här på väg någonstans i riktning att vi kan bli så duktiga på att laga så att det blir evigt liv till slut? Vad tror du? Nej, evigt liv tror jag inte på. Men eh, många DNA-skador kan ju resultera i cancer och andra allvarliga sjukdomar. Så vi vill motverka de skadorna så mycket som möjligt. Och då måste vi först förstå mekanismen för skadorna eh, eh, etableras. Tack. More questions? Who would like to continue? Yes. 
think it's Pastor Alfred. There is a microphone coming to you. Uh, does this system work the same way in our cells as in the cells of pathogens? And if there is a difference, is there any medication that uh, utilizes this? The DNA repair mechanisms are universally distributed. All living cells have repair mechanisms, but they are more or less efficient. And uh, we try to identify uh, weak targets in pathogens uh, where they are poor at repair uh, DNA, and uh, we can uh, perhaps damage them that selectively. Could you elaborate a little bit about what kind of pathogens that you are working with or considering? Uh, It's too early to say that we can target a specific pathogen this way. Yeah? We just have to understand that many of the uh, drugs we use uh, damage DNA. Yeah? And uh, so there is a balance here. We have our own repair mechanisms to try to counteract the DNA damage uh, when we want to selectively damage cells, uh, like cancer cells or infected cells, uh, the repair mechanisms are uh, less than helpful. But without repair mechanisms, we wouldn't be long-lived. One final thing. It was mentioned that cigarette smoke damages DNA. Do you know how that happens? Yes, sir. Uh, cigarette smoke contains reactive uh, small chemicals they bind to the DNA and prevent the DNA from being read properly or replicated properly. So they are mutagens. Huh? Uh, and uh, once they damage DNA, uh, this can result in a number of diseases, including cancer. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, one over there. Hej, Matilda Nyberg från Expressen. Jag tänker ur ett svenskt perspektiv, vad betyder det här priset för svensk forskning? För svensk forskning, jag följer ju svensk forskning och jag är medlem av Vetenskapsakademin och har gjort bedömningar och så vidare för dem. Bakgrunden till min egen forskning jag kommer ju från Sverige, men jag fick min ursprungliga utbildning i Sverige. Nu ringer mig i telefonen här. Vill du fråga något mer? Vad det svar på frågan? Vad, vad tror du att det kan betyda för svensk forskning framåt så att, säga, att, att, en, att en svensk prisas på det här sättet? Vad detta betyder för svensk forskning. Ja, jag tror att jag hoppas det uppmuntrar svensk forskning så, uh, genom att visa att uh, detta är grundforskning som började på Karolinska institutet och det är basen för allting jag har gjort senare. Uh, så att jag är mycket stolt och tacksam över att ha blivit. Eh, tränad på Karolinska institutet på det viset. Det är, forskning är en internationell verksamhet så jag har sedan dess många medarbetare i världen, inklusive Sverige. Tack. Vi har en fråga. Kjellgjörn Axelsson. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the chance and uh, congratulations to uh, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Sufitian Axelsson from Channel Radio and uh, Green Post. Uh, I just like to ask you that uh, uh, what was your uh, first reaction when you hear the news and did you expect these news? No, it was a surprise. I know that over the years I have occasionally been considered for a prize, but so are hundreds of other people. So. <laughs> I feel very lucky and proud to be selected today. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, I, I'm Per Snaprud from Forskning och Framsteg. Um, could you say something about what led you 
into this research? Why did you think it was an interesting problem to figure out why Cs get converted to Us and, and back? Yes, uh, I was studying the properties of DNA and found somewhat to my surprise that DNA is much more label than we usually recognize. Uh, it gets damaged in cells by the water we live in, and that cannot be avoided. So that means you have to repair the DNA all the time. That wasn't known, and nor were the mechanisms known that deal with this spontaneous DNA damage. So we have clarified that. And some of those mechanisms are also used as defense against uh, uh, dangerous compounds in the environment and drugs and so on. But the uh, main purpose is to provide uh, defense against unavoidable DNA damage. Thank you. Next question. Hello, David Keaton from the Associated Press. Uh, Professor, we're hearing the words cancer, we're hearing the words smoking. These are things that uh, touch uh, everyone can understand the impact of these diseases and uh, how, how they can affect the lives of millions of people. Can you tell us a little bit how this breakthrough in science uh, can lead to better treatment and, um, and better, better medicine? Yes. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's very important that we have DNA repair in, uh, unfortunately, individuals that have defective DNA repair they die early or uh, have serious medical problems. So, so we have to have DNA repair. On the other hand, if we treat the cancer cell with an anti-cancer drug, that often acts by damaging the DNA of the cancer cell. So we try to kill the cancer cell, and the cancer cell fights back by DNA repair. So we have two edges to this sword. Uh, we need a DNA repair, but we don't like it that the cancer cells can repair the DNA. So we have to understand the mechanism so we can selectively provide good therapies that way. So, so for the, the, the millions of people uh, that are going to be hearing about this prize today, uh, what, does it, what sort of hope should it bring to them? In the uh, somewhat longer run, uh, we can provide better treatment and better drugs because we have to understand how DNA is damaged. We can't avoid DNA damage. We live in a world where we get exposed to DNA damaging agents all the time, and many of those are in our cells, and we can't avoid them. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Pashnaprud has another one that he needs an answer of. Can we get the microphone? I'm sorry for so many questions, but it's very interesting. I'm thinking about uh, viruses. Do they have this mechanism, or how are they related anyway to this research? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, bacteria and large viruses uh, can code for their own DNA repair mechanisms, and that helps them overcome the defense mechanism of the host. That is not always a good thing for us. Eh? So we have to understand how the, the DNA repair mechanism works, eh? and this is what I and others have been doing. Eh? So we can, uh, for example, by radiation, selectively kill tumor cells without damaging the individual. Thank you. Do we have, yeah, the lady over there. You'll get the microphone right away here. Yeah. Anneli Megner Arn, TV4. Jag tar det på svenska också. Jag tänkte höra om du kan säga någonting. Jag förstår att det är svårt att säga konkret, men lite grann hur man skulle kunna boosta de här försvarssystemen så att de klarar av cancer till exempel. Ja, vi vill nog inte klara av cancer. Vad vi vill göra är att selektivt döda cancerceller. En cancercell är en abnorm version av en normal cell. Och vi, vill, vi måste förstå hur de försvarar sig så att vi kan inaktivera cancercellerna 
utan att skada de celler som i, i vår egen kropp. Och hur gör man det? Genom att ha selektiva behandlingar och sedan många år använder man radioaktiv strålning, kallas radioterapi. Och det är fortfarande ett av de allra viktigaste medel vi har att behandla cancer. Det här är ju ett av de heta områdena inom cancerforskningen idag att kunna just förhindra att cancercellerna reparerar sitt DNA. Precis. Ja. Har vi fler frågor här? Alla är nöjda så långt. Då tackar vi Thomas Lindahl för att han var med oss. Thank you very much Thomas for being with us today. Congratulations again to your Nobel Prize and welcome back to your old hometown in December. Thank you very much and apologize to the English speaking people who had to sit through the Swedish presentation too. No problem I think. Thank you very much. Bye bye for Thank now. You. Okay, let's move on to questions to uh, our experts on the panel. Questions from the media. Have we exhausted all questions uh, already or do you have anything you'd like to bring up, ask us about? <laughs> This is your chance. Yes, please. Uh, I would like, just like to know if uh, they have collaborated, the three laureates, or if... Uh, not, not to my knowledge. They, uh, they have uh, worked completely independent of each other. So. And it's different mechanisms for DNA mm. repair, as you said. Yes, more questions? Okay, okay. yes, Joanna Rose, please. Yes, I wonder, there are three different mechanisms you just mentioned. Are there many more mechanisms? that uh, the research is going on? Definitely. I mean, new DNA repair mechanisms are being discovered as we speak, probably. So uh, there are many other mechanisms that have been discovered in, in, in recent years. And one can say that uh, we give a, we give, when we talk about these prices, we talk about the original discoveries in, in, uh, in bacteria often. But what has happened is, of course, that all these three Nobel laureates, they have continued with their work for many, many years, and they have transferred their knowledge into the mammalian system, so they see that the same principles apply also in our human cells. Uh, and as I said, there are, there are definitely other forms of repair which are also very important. Uh, so this is, but these are, these are very early discoveries, and they opened up the field I understanding that mechanism that this could, could exist. When, when were they made? So in the, the, the first discoveries were, were made by Thomas Lindahl and that was in, in the early 70s that he made his, his discoveries. Then the transformation in understanding how it works was in human cells that took another 10, 20 years before sort of that come to, I wouldn't say completion because it's still studied. Uh, the others uh, did their breakthroughs in, in, in the 80s, and uh, middle of the 80s, late, late 80s, that's what, when they did the breakthroughs. And, but also them, also, also, also Sanyar and Mudrish continued and transferred the knowledge from the E. coli and bacteria into the mammalian system. And then we are into late 90s and, and, and early 2000 even, so. Thank you. Yes, please, over there. You're getting a microphone. Uh, just a short question. Why did it take so long for you to give them this prize? Sara. Um, yeah, that's a question that, of course, is difficult to answer. But each year we have a number. We have close to 400 nominations. So each, every prize cannot win every year. I guess that's the simplest answer. I think it's also fair to say that this story has unraveled step by step and, and the enormous importance has become clear more and more during more recent years. Please. 
As Thomas Lindahl is a member of the Academy, could he have been here today voting as well? Or, I mean, how common is it that you give a prize to a member of the Academy? Oh, that's very rare indeed. Has uh, it happened before? I think so. I, the last uh, prize in chemistry was uh, uh, in 1948 to Arne Tiselius and uh, I wasn't even a member then. Uh, he was probably a member, but I don't know how it was held. Thomas Lindahl has not participated at all in this process, not attended any of the meetings or contributed in written form to uh, any of the evaluations, of course. More questions? Yes, we have one over there. Hello, yeah. Matilda from Nordic Chinese Times. Um, wondering a little bit from the Chinese side, just about, not about this prize at all, but about the nomination process. Because there's a lot of Chinese people like often wondering how this process is going, like how it's proceeding and how you send out information. Are you actually sending out information to a lot of universities around the world about how to uh, nominate people for this prize? Uh, yes, this is exactly what happens. So a lot of universities and also individual scientists around the world get a letter where they're asked to nominate. Okay, is it also in all the different languages and all the different universities? Um, the letter is in English, okay. but it's sent to universities all over the world. And we pay special attention also to make sure that we include all parts of the world. All right, thank you. And we, do, we invite nominations from individual scientists at universities. We don't necessarily ask for nominations by the president of the university or the minister for science or anything like that. It's nominations by the scientists themselves, by the international scientific community. And we, as, as uh, Professor Snuggerup Linz said, we really work hard to make sure that universities all over the world are in invited to nominate. It could be scientists in China, uh, one university, the Peking, one year Ch Shanghai, the next, universities in South and North America, um, Africa, throughout Asia and Europe and Australia. We don't cover Antarctis yet, but once there is a research university in Antarctis, we'll make sure they get the chance to nominate too. More questions? If not, then there will be opportunities for uh, interviews with Nobel Committee members for those who you have requested it. Uh, but this session is about to close. We hope to see you back on Monday for the announcement of the Prize in Economic Sciences. Thank you very much for your interest and your attendance. Thanks. Bye.